Good evening, comrades and friends. I visited Moscow, Russia, in a political environment that has not existed since before I was born in 1993. What we are witnessing today is what is being commonly referred to as the New Cold War. While the USSR and socialism in Eastern Europe has been overthrown, therefore altering the character of the Cold War from a struggle between two competing social systems to the aspect of, the aspect of imperialist penetration still remains. The short-term goal of the imperialists to break the socialist system and privatize the assets built up by the working class over decades was successful. Now they're fulfilling their, trying to fulfill their long-term goal of breaking the indigenous capitalist class that has emerged in Russia that strives to preserve their own interests and maintain an environment in which they can exploit their people without interference. While it is easier for a communist point of view to defend a socialist country as opposed to a capitalist one, I nevertheless do not find it difficult to oppose the actions of NATO imperialism led by the country in which I live, the United States. In the last few years in the media, from the mouthpieces of the Pentagon and State, State, State Department, the line between which is very blurry, as, as we all know. There's sort of, uh, the media sort of is a stenographer of power, really. Um, <clears throat> um, have once, be once again began hyping up the imaginary threat of the great Russian bear in the Kremlin, endlessly plotting the demise of the so-called land of the free. As Russia has begun to get back on its feet after the overthrow of the Soviet Union and rocking of society during the turbulent 1990s, it has once again started to stand up for itself and its allies. Its defense of Iran and Syria, of course, is not out of a sense of proletarian internationalism, but out of, of self-interest. Regardless, it is necessary and very much appreciated, regardless of what those motives may be. As a result of the Russian Federation's reemergence as something other than a state to be pushed around by U.S. imperialism at will, it is facing consequences for its actions. Consequences for its actions, as, as John Kerry might put it. Since 1990, NATO has expanded into 12 countries in Eastern Europe, many of them being form formerly members of the Warsaw Pact. It is obvious the intentions of NATO to encircle Russia militarily and politically, to intimidate and to apply pressure, just as the US did to the USSR decades ago, which had a significant role in its overthrow. Since the U.S.-EU-backed coup in Ukraine, in which the U.S. State Department handpicked the leadership of the junta, Russia has taken a stand for its interests. It is, one, it is one intervention, one encroachment too far from their point of view, because they are willing to stand up for themselves and their interests, interests right on their border in a former Soviet republic, no less. They have been attacked politically and economically. At this point, the U.S. is hoping that the game of chicken between the world's largest superpower and military bloc and Russia, a country whose large military is designed purely for defense of their own territory, where, it will, where, where will it lead only, can only be speculated, for conflict between the two nuclear powers could very well spell the end of humanity altogether. Our host for the duration of our stay was Alexander Ionov, president of the anti-globalization movement of Russia. Their grouping is not a homogenous one representing one ideological current. Talking to my interpreter, Slava, who does not regard himself particularly ideological, says they have members of their organization who subscribe to Korean socialism, some are Putinists, Putinists, among others. The underlying current among all their members is a staunch opposition to Western imperialism and the determination that all nations have the right to self-determination. In fact, going to their office on their wall, they have framed photographs of Hafez and, Hafez and Bashar al-Assad, Kim Il-sung, Hugo Chavez, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Muammar Gaddafi, Omar Trijos, Torrijos, and oddly enough, George Washington, which I kind of got a kick out of myself. Uh, they did weekly demonstrations in solidarity with the Cuban Five and held Black Lives Matter demonstrations outside the U.S. Embassy. In fact, if you go to Russian YouTube and look up Death to Israel, the first video that shows up is Alexander and their organization in front of the Israeli embassy shouting Death to Israel in Arabic, uh, which he was really, uh, he made a point to show us that. We, we all kind of got a kick out of that too. Uh, as I arrived at my hotel in Moscow, the Metrop Metropole, which is literally uh, d directly across the street from the entrance to Red Square, I saw the anti-Maidan demonstration being set up to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the coup in Ukraine. The demonstration was massive, nearly 100,000 people marched, representing various political forces in Russia, from the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, Russian veteran organizations, the Green Party, and Nightwolf Bikers, among many other groups. 
The aim was to send a message that a Russian Maidan or Washington Western NGO orchestrated color revolution is not a possibility in Russia. It was a show of strength among patriotic Russian elements. In Donbas, the Russian majority, southeastern Ukraine, the US armed and directed Ukrainian army indiscriminately bombed civilian, the civilian population. In the last year, an estimated 6,000 people or more have died in the fighting, many of whom are non-combatants, of which the vast majority are in Donbas. The second day of our trip, we visited a hospital in which seven Ukrainian children are being treated for injuries sustained in the shelling. One of whom we visit, a famous case, was a 10-year-old boy named Vanya. Of course, when you're being shelled by artillery, it is impossible to stay in your basement every single day, every, all day, every day, and uh, uh, it's impossible to stay every day. And gather, and, but you have, you have to gather supplies and go outside just to you know, regain your sanity, walk around, uh, things like that. Um, one, one day when Vanya and his five-year-old brother were playing outside in the garden, the junta's shelling struck their home, bringing it completely to the ground. Vanya's brother died, and his legs were blown off, he lost one arm, and he was entirely blinded by shrapnel. We visited others whose conditions were not as serious, but regardless, their lives are forever altered by this conflict that they had nothing to do with at all and no say in. The head doctor at the facility has publicly stated that he would like to see Poroshenko, Obama, Merkel, and, and Putin to have, the no to have the negotiations over the conflict near Vanya's hospital bed as he lay so they can be aware of the human toll and what is at stake. The anti-globalization movements conference I spoke at wasn't particularly large, but it was, I was thoroughly impressed by its content. Most of the attendants were young and belonged to the organization. Along with the, along with the U.S. delegation I went with, there's a speaker from Iran as well as a, the Venezuelan representative from the embassy. Unfortunately, I didn't know what many of the speakers were saying because my Russian is extremely rudimentary and I don't speak any Farsi at all. Um, but the, the, the declaration of the conference I had a role in drafting was based on mutual cooperation between the various peoples of the world. I can assure everybody in the U.S. that Russia does not seek out conflict with the West. From their point of view, there is literally nothing to be gained. The sanctions imposed on them and indirectly imposed by the, on the EU by the U.S. is mutually harmful. The Russian ruling capitalists themselves are primarily interested in commerce and given the German imperialists, even the German imperialists are suffering as well. Not that I have a whole lot of sympathy for them, but it just goes to show that the U.S. is pushing even their al Of course they're pushing their allies to do things that they don't want to do. I mean, even the spying on Merkel's uh, cell phone was evidence of that enough. But uh, I digress. I don't mean to portray the Russian capitalists as a benevolent force of peace based on moral principles, but it is a material self-interest. There are no way of... No way capable of invading the U.S. as they are portrayed to be interested in by the U.S. media. To believe such tales, one would have to be completely ignorant of the balance of forces vis-a-vis -vis NATO and the Russian Federation. Russia does not have bases stretching across the world, does not have troops in Mexico and Canada ready to pounce at a moment's notice. They have a large military force, but it is more or less confined behind the Russian lines. And actually, thinking right now, I'm pretty sure that they only have bases in one other country, and that's uh, Belarus and uh, they have very close ties with one another, but it is also defensive for Belarus because they would rather have Russian forces, a country that they're friendly with, than, have, uh, than be Estonia, Lithuania, or any of the other former Soviet republics that are now in the grip of the United States. I went as a delegation of peace from within the belly of the beast to demonstrate be that between working people of all countries, cooperation is possible, as well as within our best interests. We hope to further cultivate a relation between ourselves and the anti-globalization movement and the Russian people. And when and if the U.S. decides to plunge humanity into a nuclear Armageddon, we will vocally be on the side of those defending themselves from rec reckless imperialist aggression. Thank you.